I'd like to just uh, go ahead and get started here. My name is Sean Nestor. I'm on the uh, executive committee here for the Single Payer Action Network. Thank you for reelecting me for another year. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, a little bit about me. I'm based out of Toledo, where I've always lived. I'm an organizer and activist out in that area, doing lots of things. Uh, some of the relevant credentials here are that I uh, attended Camp Wellstone, which is a boot camp put on by some folks involved with the Wellstone campaign for those who remember Paul Wellstone and uh, you know it's a great experience in terms of going over just about everything there is to do with political campaigns from raising money to doing social media to doing press conferences to messaging to doing interviews you name it every aspect of campaigning was covered uh, with exercises and that was sort of a baptism that uh, really helped me to understand the way to do political messaging and political framework but uh, I've also devoted some time to reading and practicing a lot of other aspects of political messaging which lead me to the presentation we're doing today. Uh, in Toledo, I've been, uh, I managed a, camp a successful citizens initiative campaign, one with 70% approval, um, sensible marijuana ordinance, which has now been copied in a few other cities and is growing in uh, Ohio. I've also worked on a move to amend Democracy Day initiative that was also successful, and I'm currently working on two more. Uh, so uh, most of my experience is with issue campaigns and I have a pretty good track record with it and um, a lot of what I'm talking about today ties directly into that because every campaign I've been involved with, I don't know about you, but it's usually not funded by big corporations. It's entirely grassroots and when you do that, you really have to pay attention to how you do things uh, because when, it, uh, when you do a political campaign, whether it's for a candidate or for an issue, um, I heard it put best at Camp Wellstone. Every campaign is an exercise in managing scarce resources. Okay, I mean, um, you can all sit down in a group and talk about things you should do with the campaign, and they're all going to be good ideas. Nobody's going to come up with a bad idea during a brainstorming session. But what you really have to do is figure out what's going to be the most effective way to use our time, our money, and our volunteers so that we can be effective at getting the word out and getting this issue passed. Now, knowing that in a couple years or so, we're going to be looking at doing another initiative here in Ohio if we need to in order to get single payer in this state, we need to start thinking in terms of how we're going to structure our political campaign on a statewide level. And that's a tall order, but it can be done. And what I'm talking about during the presentation today are some of the initial thoughts we need to go through about framing and messaging. How many people here are familiar with George Lakoff by show of hands? It's a fair amount. How many people here have read Don't Think of an Elephant? Right. Excellent. So I know at least a few people have. And some of the content here is pulled directly from that book. It's a fairly quick read, only about 100 or so pages, a very good material. But I'm going to be pulling some of the key parts out of it to help explain uh, what's uh, my point here about messaging. What's so the name of it? it's uh, Don't Think of an Elephant. So check that out if you can. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, get started here. So I want to be clear about what this presentation is. Okay, because there's a lot of things. We're talking about a fairly broad subject, which is, you know, political messaging. But I want this presentation is going to be a broad overview of what it is and why it's important. Uh, we're going to examine some of the things that are essential to making up a strong political message and uh, kind of a framework for figuring out what a good political message might be. So that's really what we're trying to talk about here. Um, we could go into all sorts of specifics and nuances, but my goal here is not to get lost in the weeds with a lot of details so much as to make sure that everybody in the room kind of has the same basic understanding. It starts from the same jumping off point when you inevitably come together in your regions or in your constituency groups or just in whoever you're working with to try to advance this issue, whether that's on a statewide level or elsewhere. So let's talk a little bit about what messaging is. And I think one of the most common misconceptions is that messaging is about developing a really catchy slogan. And uh, we want to be clear that what we talk about when we're saying political messaging is not like it, you're an advertising campaign guy and you're trying to think of the, you know, the got milk of the single payer movement or something like that. You're really trying to think about um, ways that it's more about how you're framing things, how you're talking about things, ways that will tap into people's personal experiences that in a way that they will respond not just intellectually but emotionally to the issue you're talking about. You know, consistently with single payer, we're kind of always running into the obstacle that we have all these studies, all these facts, all these statistics, all these other living examples of other countries that have single payer universal health care and have much better outcomes. I mean, for many people, they would say it's a no-brainer here in the United States, and it's probably a point of frustration that we haven't already accomplished this. And what I think we need to realize is that 
there's a political fight that has to be won, not just a logical, rational, intellectual one, but a political fight. And all politics is not just intellect, it's also emotional. It's also experience-based. Hello? Oh. Uh, all right, do I need this? Uh, okay, so I'm sorry if I wasn't projecting loud enough for those in the back. Um, hopefully they're still picking me up on the camera too. I'll try not to wave around too much. But uh, this isn't just about creating a catchy slogan. It's a lot deeper than that. It's about tapping into the experiences that we have as human beings in a way that's going to resonate deeply with people and motivate them to say, yes, this is what we need to do. So that's really what we're talking about. Um, some of the key things that we want to think about are how do we make a message that's succinct, consistent, and compelling? Those three attributes are very important to focus on. Now, being succinct is very important because we kind of live in an era where people are constantly bombarded with communication. Advertisements, television, radio, the internet itself is kind of like just walking into a minefield of information. The problem these days is not a lack of information, it's how do we find information that really resonates with us in a way that we're going to respond? You know, how do we kind of move through all the noise and get to the signal? And uh, so that's why being succinct matters because attention spans are what they are. People are, you're kind of always having to compete with all the other things going on in a person's life. Their job, their family, um, what's going on in their community that might be a little more direct to them. Single payer and medical issues are always affecting people, but it's a question of is it affecting them right now? There's a kind of an immediacy that you have to be considerate of. And sometimes you only get a small window of opportunity to really get into their mind and, and really you know, connect. And that's why being succinct matters so much. Uh, being consistent is another underestimated aspect of messaging. Um, sometimes you'll talk, to, you'll see people who are really big into political consulting and uh, political campaigns, and they'll often talk about how the other candidate had stronger message discipline. That's a term, kind of a buzzword that gets thrown out there, but I kind of like it uh, because it, what it talks about is when you run for office, you have to be able to get a message across to voters that they really resonate with. And the best way to do that is to kind of be a little repetitive, to get used to talking about the same two or three things so that people associate those issues and those concerns with you as a candidate. If you're changing what you're talking about every time people hear about you, it may not connect. That repetition is necessary. So being consistent is a way to do that. Applying it to something like single payer or any other kind of issue campaign, it's not so much about having two or three issues the way you would if you were a candidate, as it is two or three major points that they're always going to come back to about why this issue matters and why this is the solution to the problem we have. So uh, in any successful campaign, campaign, messaging is critical. Whether you're running for office as a candidate or you're running an issue campaign, you need to be able to have a strong message that's consistent, compelling, and succinct to the greatest degree possible. So, uh, you know, pretty fundamental stuff here. We need to talk about uh, creating a campaign that's going to have a strong, consistent message. Uh, at some point, this organization, probably through the state council, is going to work on developing what, it, what are our major two or three points to advance single payer in Ohio. Because I think if you talk to just about any of us, we could think of at least a dozen. I know I can. I can think of a dozen compelling reasons to go to single payer. And I can even tailor them to the kind of person I think you are. If I think that you're probably a little bit more skewing toward the conservative side of politics, there are some arguments I can make that are very compelling about expanding choice. You know, you're, not, you're no longer bound by uh, certain provider networks. You're free to go find any uh, market-based doctor that, uh, you know, it's all just a matter of who's going to serve you best. That's real choice. Um, you know, that, that's an argument you can make to conservative voters that's uh, very compelling. But if I'm more progressive, or if the voter is more progressive, I can frame it in terms of values like everybody needs to be uh, covered, including people that are marginalized or vulnerable. So, you know, some of this is just on this slide is just reiterating some of these points. Um, things need to be succinct to be understandable to people whose attention spans are you know, limited because of just the way the world is today. Uh, they need to be compelling. So. It's not enough to say this is an issue. You kind of have to point out why this is an issue right now, why this is something to work on you know, today. 
Because I think if you go to just about anybody, they're going to tell you, well, you know, I'm getting a lot of emails these days. I'm getting a lot of uh, Facebook invitations to go to a protest for one thing or another. Why should I single out something like single payer and put that in my priority list? Why should I go to that rally instead of the one across town about environmental issues or something else? You know, why is this so urgent compared to other matters going on? And um, you have to be consistent, and that kind of has a way of creating strength and institutional uh, kind of memory with folks in a way that really builds up over time. So let's talk about how all these things work together. Some of the questions we have to ask, you know, do we want to emphasize studies or statistics? Do we want to emphasize personal stories or anecdotes that we've had, you know, why we personally care about things? And when we do that, do we do it from the perspective of a friend who's been a patient and had a bad experience? Do we do it from the perspective of I have a friend who's a doctor and what they saw was just terrible? Um, do you try to stress moral or ideological arguments? And of course, if I, if I brought this up into a small focus group of, of people here, they'd probably say, of course, all those things are great, right? And that's true. But where you're at, who your audience is, and what you're trying to accomplish is going to kind of involve tweaking each aspect of those to cater to that specific crowd. Some crowds uh, might already be sympathetic, so you don't need to spend a lot of time pointing out to them how great single payer is. They already know. They just want to know what we can do about it. So in that regard, you're going to emphasize certain elements about SPAN and single payer to stress why it's feasible and why we can do it and what we can do to advance that. Other audiences might be more skeptical. Uh, they might not have as much background on single payer, so you have to go um, kind of do a broader argument and figure out what's going to resonate the most. <laughs> you have to kind of guess a little bit at demographics with that oftentimes. But um, we are going to use all of those things and probably more in differing d degrees depending on who our audience is. And that's part of what developing a messaging strategy is. Uh, hopefully, yeah, I've been part of helping Single Payer Action Network here develop a campaign plan and a strategy, which is something that's an ever-evolving thing. And one of the things we're going to have to create is a messaging strategy that helps us stay consistent over the years in a way that helps us to build long-term support. So this is where we get into uh, some of Lakoff's work here. So George Lakoff, he's a cognitive linguist, yeah, which is a pretty fancy title. Uh, but it's his job to actually study the way that we have a reaction to certain words. That's his profession, but he's also a very progressive-minded thinker. And he's published some books essentially analyzing the way um, conservatives have framed things in order to be successful politically. And he has some critiques and some arguments about what people who are more liberal or progressive-leaning can do to try to frame their arguments better, how to kind of win the, the war in terms of framing and messaging. And uh, so that's kind of what his deal is. And uh, he has this concept of frames that I guess is fairly common in the field of cognitive linguistics. And uh, what we're really talking about is the way certain words or phrases evoke kind of just inherent aspects of our lives, you know, who we are as people. And he kind of identifies that there's two major categories that we come across. Uh, particularly when it comes to politics, and that's a strict father framing and a nurturant parent framing. And um, no one is ever 100% with either or. You know, depending on the issue or depending on what the matter is, uh, you're going to kind of maybe take one or the other, and you may skew more one way or the other, but you're not 100% in either category. And uh, one of the, his, his exercises he typically has folks do is, you know, he'll say something like, don't think of an elephant. And, of course, what most people do right after that is, think of an elephant because you just brought that up. So even when you're trying to, this is uh, an argument to the point that you can't really build a sus uh, sustainable long-term movement strictly out of what you oppose, something that I thought Greg touched on very eloquently earlier today. You can't build something by just saying, I don't like this thing. In order to build something that lasts and has an impact, you have to talk about what this thing, what the alternative is and why it's good for you and why we can do it. And to that end, you don't want to get stuck telling people constantly, don't think of an elephant. You might want to say something like, think of an aardvark. <laughs> you know, direct them to what the solution is instead of focusing on the problem and saying that, that thing's bad. So these two frameworks of strict father and nurturant parent kind of, you know, this really frames how we look at a lot of different issues. 
you know, um, there's a whole, if you read Don't Think of an Elephant, they'll kind of go into detail about how it all breaks down and, you know, kind of subcategories of conservative thought and progressive thought. But there's certain unique ties that bring it all together. And that's what we're going to look at here. So in the strict father kind of framework, uh, there are cer certain assumptions, such as the world is a dangerous place. And the world is difficult because it's competitive. And there's always going to be winners and losers. There's no way around it. It's just an immutable law of nature. Uh, there is such a thing as an absolute right and an absolute wrong. You know, very little gray area. Children are born bad in that they do just what feels good instead of what's right. And to be made good, they require discipline. And um, this is, as you may have guessed, sort of more identified along conservative thought. Right? Maybe already you're thinking about the ways that if you really thought about, if your worldview is really lines up with these fundamental assumptions, you're probably more likely to take a certain stance on foreign policy, for example. So let's take a look at um, how this gets turned into an agenda for somebody who really subscribes to those assumptions. Well, we need to protect the family in a dangerous world, and we need to support that family in a difficult world. Teaching children right from wrong, very important. So we need to give subsidies to corporations. We need to have a very strong, heavy-handed foreign policy. And social programs that enable people to be lazy or to have bad behavior, well, we need to get rid of that stuff. People need to grow tough because that's the only way to truly survive. There's some short-term pain, but long-term, this is what's good for them. And we want to reward good people. And the best way to figure out who's a good person is to look at who's prosperous, who's obviously been able to understand the world, adapt to it, demonstrate strength by succeeding in it. We need to reward those people with typically tax cuts. I mean, that's the, that's the idea, right? They're str they've proven that they're good, so let's incentivize that by giving them tax cuts and giving them more freedom, more, more ability to influence the world. And we need to use discipline when people who are essentially children act unruly. That's why we have to have very strong policies regarding incarceration and uh, warfare. You know, these are just people who have never grown up, and the way we're going to make them grow up is to beat them over the head. And, um, you know, that, that's an idea that some people have. And so typically, these unruly children are underdeveloped nations. You know, they're not mature enough, and, you know, if we just bomb them, you know, they'll get the message eventually and conform to the way they need to be in order to survive in this world. Because we understand what the immutable laws of nature are, and until they get right with that, um, they're just sort of, um, you know, misguided children. So when it comes to trying to apply this framing uh, politically, you know, there's some creative things we can do wordsmith-wise. So when we talk about tax cuts, uh, some of the examples Lakoff uses are that we don't call them just tax cuts. We call them tax relief, right? So we're getting creative here. We're getting a little poetic. But we're tapping into the assumption. If, if we understand what the conservative assumptions are and the conservative worldview is, Tax relief is a phrase that just makes sense because taxes are just a burden. In fact, they're basically a penalty for succeeding. So taxing people who are successful is just the worst thing in the world. If we can give them relief, we're promoting the worldview that successful, wealthy people need to be rewarded. So that's why you hear terms like that. Um, one of the examples he uses, too, is when we talked about in the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And we move forward without uh, UN approval, George Bush, our president at the time, used the phrase, well, we don't need a permission slip to defend America. And think about what that implies, to need a permission slip. Well, that, what does that evoke in, in, your, in your mind? High school. High school, right? Everybody, you know, it's a common experience, right? So we're tapping into a common experience that most people just understand about, well, you're in high school and some, there's some teacher that tells you you need a permission slip to go somewhere, to go to the bathroom, to go to on, on, a, on a trip. So in that framing, we're assuming that America's been put in this relationship with the United Nations where they're just this teacher that's trying to impose all these rules, these authoritarian rules. And uh, we don't need a permission slip. We've got to defend ourselves. Think about what that implies, especially in the context of what was actually happening. You know, think about that. Uh, when we talk about uh, repealing the estate tax, we want to eliminate the death tax. You know, how morbid and how awful it is to tax people just for dying, you know? 
And of course, public health care, as we all know, well, we get death panels from that. It's a famous, uh, you know, argument that came up during the ACA debates, the death panels, you know, uh, as though insurance companies don't basically have death panels already. But, uh, you know, we have this government takeover of medicine. You know, think about what's implied with that government takeover. There's always these overtones of authoritarianism and fascism. Uh, this is socialism, which is the same thing that the Nazis had. So if you don't like Nazis, you hate socialism. And that's exactly what this is. Trying to cover everyone with health care is basically Nazi Germany. <laughs> it's where this weird line of reasoning ends up. And while most people in this audience might not agree with it, that's actually something that makes sense to people who subscribe to this you know, strict father framework. But as much as you may disagree with that, it's important to understand that this is a worldview that many people have. And if you want to talk to them about this issue, and you do, you have to at least understand where they're coming from. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about the nurturant parent model, which is more associated with progressive or, or liberal outlooks. The framing assumptions here are slightly different. Actually, a lot different. But um, the assumptions here are that children are born good and they can be made better. The world can be made a better place and it's our job to facilitate that. And the job of any parent is to just nurture their children and to raise their children to be nurturant of others, to take care of other people and have just a common goodness about them. And this is sort of the outlook that frames more progressive ideology. So the agenda here is that we, we want to see the spread of empathy. That word alone is probably a pretty good in, way of encompassing it. We just want to see empathy in the way our systems work. We don't want to throw everyone to the wolves and just say, this is how it is, deal with it. We want to try to find a way to help people, especially the people who are being hurt the most. So you have a responsibility to yourself and to others. Um, you're going to help your family, your community, your country, the world. Fairly ambitious, but you know, this is what we want to do. We want to ascribe to be on a higher plane. You got to be able to take care of yourself so you can take care of others. You got to protect children. Um, you want your children to be fulfilled and happy, not just surviving, but to have that deeper aspect that life is actually enjoyable, something they want to pursue. And of course, you want to protect the environment because you need a place for your children to live, you know. And uh, freedom and civil liberties are important so that children can experiment, seek out, find what it is that makes them fulfilled and happy, to have that room to explore. You know, it's very important. So those are some of the framing that goes on with the agenda of people who are more progressive. So there are also some frames that, you know, some people here, they, they tend to think it's aligned one way or another, but these are actually fairly neutral. Words like freedom and liberty actually have some competing frameworks associated with them, okay? Those are not necessarily strict parent or strict father or nurturant parent. They can go either way, depending. And there's always kind of a, a war of words going on in the country about what it means, what freedom and liberty really mean. You know, that's really where the battleground is, is what, what is freedom? And freedom for who? And freedom to do what? And how does that tie into concepts of liberty? So let's talk about single payer through the lens of these frames. So if we want to talk about promoting single payer to somebody who's got more of a strict a strict father, I should, let's just say strict father, not strict parent, but strict father model. Well, we could say things like, uh, you know, let's business, let's make sure that business can focus on doing business. Okay, business is important, and to that end, we need to clear it up so that they don't have to worry about all this other stuff with healthcare. With single payer model, you know, their healthcare is already taken care of, and a business doesn't need to worry about all that stuff. It's less bureaucracy, less paperwork. I think in that regard, how many people here have seen the Fix It documentary? Excellent, yeah. And that, that documentary, which I'm a big fan of, largely works within that strict father model of, look, let's get, this is pro-business, let's get the bureaucracy out of the way. <coughs> now the nurturant parent model would say, well, we need to heal people who get hurt, especially those who are least able to afford it. That's part of having empathy, all right? And to that end, that's why I think probably a lot of people here today in this room are here because you have that feeling that it's uh, about trying to protect the vulnerable. So uh, talking about freedom or liberty, eh, this is, doesn't necessarily go to either frame, but when we talk about lowering taxes, you know, and I've made the argument, uh, you know, you could just kind of say co-pays, co-insurance, premium, deductible, these are taxes. 
And lowering taxes, even though we often describe it because it's a major agenda item for people who have more of that strict father outlook, um, lowering taxes is actually you know, a fairly universal thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be either or. Um, when we talk about promoting freedom, you know, lowering taxes, just making it more clear cut does that. Dennis? Sean, I'm thinking about the word taxes because a lot of people consider, well, how do you pay for single payer? Well, through a... And then I'm thinking maybe we ought to rearrange that word a little bit, and I thought an enrollment right. might be a better word. So, I mean... Or uh, some, some way to... I'm thinking of the framing of the term when you enroll in a group of an organization right. that's different than being taxed to be part of it. For sure. Like a membership... Fee. I don't want to call it a fee, but a membership privilege, you know, right now. Right. Like, there's something about the wording right. about when we say how is single payer going to be financed, we should make it something welcoming, like everyone feels like they want to help out their community, their friends, their children, their parents. Right. And that's essentially what it is, rather right. than a tax. So the word enrollment, right? And we could probably, I won't go too deep into this. Uh, I think that's an excellent point, but when we talk about what di certain words might mean to different people, you know, we could talk about the merits of a word like enrollment, and of course, you know, somebody who's really, just really big on the strict father model will always say, well, you're just lying. It's, it's really a tax, and it's taxes are the worst thing, but that doesn't mean that you don't make that argument. You just have to, it's a, that's a strategic decision. That's a little bit into the specifics that I don't want to go into right now. Because um, I do want to be you know, preaching about time, but um, I think you're starting to think in some of the terms we want to get people rolling into after this presentation. You know, these are the conversations we want to have about words like enrollment, which may have a different uh, context or connotation to them that may tap into certain frameworks, and what would the impact of those frameworks be? And the fact that in a single payer system, you get to choose where you get service. You're not limited by provider networks. Um, you know, that supports an element of freedom. You know, that's something that's universally appealing, whether you're somebody who subscribes more to a strict father or nurturant parent model. So if we want to oppose single payer, because we do need to think in these terms, what does it mean, to, you know, what are the most common arguments? And, you know, the, probably the big one is, well, it's a government takeover of medicine. And the implication here is that government is a runaway bureaucracy intent on imposing the will of a few onto many or uh, the will of some elites or some corrupt people onto others. So therefore, this is a reduction of freedom to have government involved in any way, shape, or form. Now we know that you, know, you can always cite the logical examples of things like Medicare, which are not quite that, <laughs> and say, well, that doesn't really line up with reality, but that's the framework you're competing with, is the sense that anything government is terrible. That's part of the frame. It's not necessarily a logical conclusion, but it is part of a framework that's been established and strongly facilitated through very careful marketing over many decades. Same thing with death panels, you know, that term. Again, it harkens to the idea of this cold, distant bureaucracy that's going to decide for you um, what's going on. And because it's government, it's got to be corrupt and it's got to be some elitists deciding for you what's going on. Now, many of you might think that's pretty much how health insurance companies operate, and you might be right, but uh, that's kind of neither here nor there. So what kind of framework is evoked when someone hears these terms? You know, George Lakoff is kind of famous for um, pointing out that he's a big critic of the term single payer. And he says, when people hear the term single payer, it doesn't really mean much to them. That's, that's not, that doesn't really tap into any frames. It's an arc, it's a, it sounds kind of complicated. Anything that needs to be explained to people is, you know, you kind of run up against the obstacle that you sound like somebody who's has to educate them. And we always talk about that, right? We talk about wanting, we need to educate people. But you have to be careful with that because it's easy to come off as condescending. It's easy to come off as, well, you're just too stupid to know what's better for you. And that, again, what does that do? You know? So there's been some studies done recently about the way sometimes people who are more into that nurturing parent model the way they tend to think about people who have the strict father model, you know, there's definitely some antagonism there. And the way that they often talk about people who have that strict father outlook does come off and actually ingrains them deeper into the sense that these people are just elitists who want to impose their worldview on the rest of us. They want to erode freedom. 
when you take a condescending attitude or an attitude that they feel is condescending because you need to explain to them this weird term and it takes longer than a few seconds to understand, you know, it, that reinforces that negative framework of this is just somebody coming in to tell me what, how to run my life and how things need to be. And I don't like that. So Lakoff has his, that particular criticism of single payer. But um, other terms like universal health care, that might make more sense to folks. What about Medicare for all? That one gets a lot of praise simply because a lot of people have experience with Medicare and they tend to like it. Uh, they say it's, you know, by polling the most successful government, you know, the most popular government program that's in existence because the outcomes have been so uh, effective and it's been so helpful in saving people's lives. So that's why you'll hear a lot of people say we should really um, frame this as Medicare for all. You know, that might be a, a term that's a little more plain, a little more direct, people can easily tap into. You know, when we talk about, uh, you know, famously, how a lot of people don't seem to understand the difference between the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare. Think about how that taps into framing. When certain people hear the word Obama, they have, it conjures up all sorts of images of nasty things. Um, a Muslim, a Democrat, <laughs> a liberal, a terrorist. You know, they, they have all these ideas that they associate with the term Obama, which is why there was such a strong campaign to associate the Affordable Care Act with Obama by calling it Obamacare. And you know, that's how it wound out. And that's why we see such a distinction when we poll people about, well, how do you feel about the Affordable Care Act? Well, it tends to be a lot more positive than Obamacare. You know, they turn the word Obama into a slur. This is about tapping into framing and piggybacking on tops of well-funded campaigns to paint certain people or ideas in a certain light. You need to be sensitive to that when you talk about building a political framework or messaging framework. And of course, if you hear something like HR 676, what do you think, what kind of framework does that evoke? I don't know, it sounds a little arcane to me. Not that HR 676 is bad, far from it, but that term by itself would not go far. And unfortunately, sometimes I see you know, a lot of articles, HR 676 is our solution. So is that a robot or an Android or what is it? Yeah. Actually, while I think Medicare for all is the best of all of those up there, uh, my experience has also been that a lot of people don't even, if you're not older, you don't go Medicare, right. years, you confuse Medicare with Medicaid. Right. And, and then they just, they don't, they don't get that either. Right. Like I have found myself having to explain and then I get feel frustrated because yeah. they, they didn't get through. Really. Well, and that's why we're having this conversation because the truth is even though, you know, a lot of people have weighed in and invade that they feel that Medicare for all is the best term, I think the reality is that it's not always for exactly the reason you cite. And that's why um, we need to get into the practice of really trying to evaluate the demographics of who we're talking to and try to understand their framework and talk in terms and phrases that might you know, resonate more with them, that tap into the frameworks they already subscribe to, rather than trying to insist that they subscribe to a framework we might have. Yes? Can we have more than one framework and still have a successful message? Yes. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've ran for office before, I've helped other people run for office, and one of the big things, especially people who are newer to that role, is sometimes people feel icky, for lack of a better term, because when they go in front of one group of people, they're going to say things a certain way, and when they go in front of another group of people, they should say it a different way. And I've had some people say, I really don't like that because I feel like I'm being dishonest. I would naturally want to speak this way, why should I adapt that because of a different group? I say, well, who are you speaking? What's your end goal with what you're trying to say? Is it to express to the world what your thoughts are, or is it to try to build a relationship with the people in your audience? And if you're trying to build a relationship with the people in your audience, you should probably think about where they're coming from and where you can build a bridge with them, even if you disagree with them on certain fundamental issues, such as how your worldview is. You know, that's why it's so important. And I think when we talk about developing a messaging framework for single payer, that's what we want to think about is what's going to resonate the most with people for a broad campaign. Like for example, if we're going to, we only have enough funds to create one commercial that we can air in a bunch of different communities, what's going to give us the best bang for our buck while still tapping into certain frameworks that people resonate with? There's a tactical decision that has to go on there about do you try to frame that more in a strict, uh, uh, strict father, nurturant parent, or something a little more neutral framework-wise in order to really maximize the return on that. Going back again to the fact that every campaign is just an exercise in managing scarce resources. 
ideally you'd be able to develop one commercial for you know, uh, strict father types, another for nurturing parent types, do a little bit of studying and air them in different markets. I'm going to go ahead and guess that we're never going to have the kind of funding to do that sort of thing. I just operate under the assumption of grassroots organizing, um, but that's what you have to look at. Yes? Um, when you say universal health care, um, uh, are you going to talk about um, the propaganda and lies that people are being fed? Because sometimes they'll say universal health care, like Canada, and they go, oh my God, Canada can't get care. Well, I lived in Canada for 20, over 20 years, and Canadians wouldn't turn back for, their, for to the American way to have health care. Right. And so I try to say, well, it's a lie. What you've been fed is, li you know, you can't say that, but it's true. There's so many lies about the Canadian health care system that Americans are afraid of universal health care like the one in Canada. But well, you say, well, what about Europe and how they're handling it? Well, let's unpack that a little bit, right? Let's, when you say Americans, you know, believe these lies, I'm gonna, I'll push back on that and say, some Americans believe those lies. I know quite a few Americans who know their lies and are actively going out there telling everybody that all the time, right? But that's important though, because think about that. A lot of times, because we're operating from this kind of minority position, we get used to thinking that, you know, because there's a very vocal and well-funded, set of people who believe things a certain way, we're hyper-focused on them, almost to the point of elevating them to be the majority, to be America. But we can't lose sight of the fact that we're America too, and there's quite a few people, in fact, by polling, quite a few people actually like single payer or universal health care. But you're right that we need to think about how do we reach to those people, and that's a practical question when we go back to this framing. What happens when somebody says, I read a report from the American Enterprise Institute that I believe strongly in, and it told me that Canadians hate their universal health care, and they're coming across the border to get our superior American health care. Now, you can say, well, that's a lie, and I lived in Canada. You're tying into that direct anecdotal experience, but does that necessarily win them over? Probably not, and that's the difficulty. This is the, this is the knot we're trying to untangle by going deep into understanding how people think of these terms and finding ways to bridge connections that aren't strictly antagonistic, right. which oftentimes they are just by default in, a, in our discourse because we don't have these conversations about how to build bridges even with people we disagree with, even with people who see the world in fundamentally different lights, but still nonetheless would probably support this if we can just find a way to bridge that gap. Question. Did we speak to the strict father framework by like articulating some outrage, why are we getting a bad fiscal deal? Yeah. I think that's a very effective way to do it. Um, I think generally speaking, and on a personal opinion level, um, look, you know, if you look back at this last year's election, uh, you know, there's a lot of, that's been written about you know, the dichotomy of a Bernie Sanders and a Donald Trump. And I think one thing that was in common is they were both kind of had this demeanor of you know, just go get them, kind of like uh, kick an ass kind of mentality. And I think that resonated with a lot of people because people are frustrated with the status quo, generally. And there's a, a way of doing that that really tapped into the strict father kind of policy stuff, which was Donald Trump. And there was one that did more of a nurturant parent, which was Bernie Sanders. Now, they're both using that sort of inherent framework of I'm pissed off and I want to do something, which probably taps into a certain aspect of strict father. But again, you know, not everyone is just your strict father, your nurturant parent, and so on. We all have a little bit of both. And I think depending on context, I think right now a lot of people are wishing that there were more politicians speaking in those strict father terms, at least about pushing policies. And that's kind of the weird thing that I think a lot of people struggle to, to think about is a strict father framing for what's ultimately a nurturant parent policy. <laughs> you know, that's, which is what it is. Um, I don't want to get too wrapped up in questions because I, I have a few more slides. So if it's something that can wait. I just wanted to hear that again. Sure. You want to repeat that? Would you repeat what you said? Oh, I, I mentioned that maybe we could address the problem by um, evoking, we could address the strict father framework by you know, evoking some outrage that we're getting a poor fiscal deal and we're being taken advantage of. But he addressed the poor, poor what deal? Fiscal. 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 Poor fiscal deal. Yeah. Okay. okay. So let me, uh, these are some really great questions. I'm hoping we can get a few more in, into them. Uh, let me see, let's go through this here. You know that you're really rich. If you don't have to pay taxes, <laughs> if you're working, man, and you work extra years to increase your retirement, then they come back at you and say you made too much money, so we're going to end up taxing you a couple thousand dollars. Right. 
working people are paying more and when you look at how it affects their actual livelihood working people are by far the people who support this country and the burdens getting greater all the time while those who don't lift a hand are you know getting away with that's a whole other element that I would love to get into with you. I don't want to get too far. I'm, I might be at the wrong meeting for that one. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, working through this, um, just some things about creating a succinct message. You know, one of the things we've got to start doing as we develop what it is we want to say and how we want to say it is we need to practice being compelling, you know, get, putting the right emphasis on certain words. You know, what do we say casually and what do we say with real emotion in our voice? You know, pay attention to that kind of stuff. Um, avoid, just as a general rule, I think one of the biggest mistakes is that people go in with a study or an article that points out some statistic, and they feel like that's the smoking gun. That's, that's the silver bullet. People just know that. And I think most people here, if you've tried that, you know that that usually doesn't work. In fact, there's some studies that suggest that only makes people dig their heels in further and say, you're wrong, and you've been fed misguided information, and you've been misled. But you know that's kind of a conundrum that you have to work around. So I think that statistics and numbers are important, but I think they're most important as backup evidence if the validity gets questioned. It's usually not the strongest opening uh, lob. And uh, actually, visuals go a really long way, which is where if you if you use Facebook or social media a lot, you're probably used to seeing memes, you know, a picture that just kind of uses a succinct phrase or message or a single statistic, but they visually illustrate it in some way with a chart or a graph. <laughs> or something humorous, you know, those actually can go a long way in communicating a message very concisely and effectively. And I think that's actually a, you know, kind of a new <laughs> burgeoning enterprise for some folks. To make the message consistent, one thing is that every communication, and I mean every bit of communication that this organization comes out with, should be reiterating the same few things, always tying back to the same message so that a political identity and a political message gets established that isn't across the board. Now right now SPAN has some really good materials. We actually have brochures uh, catered to demographics. We have a brochure that says, you know, for conservative framing. We have a brochure that talks about, we go through all these different angles. But what we need to do is boil that down to what's really going to be the most effective and start to figure out what, what are the things that get, get us the biggest bang for our buck and then when we need to get into those specific demographics, yeah, we can have those materials and those resources and those talking points ready. But I think being consistent ends up over the long term having a lot more impact. And again, you need to stress the urgency. You know, you need to talk about why this matters now, not just in an abstract way, but you know, people's lives are on the line. It's something that I think uh, we lose sight of sometimes when we get into the abstract arguments and the nitty gritty of political movement is what we're doing really does come down to saving lives. And that's a real important calling. So every action that we take needs to feed into that message. Every rally we hold, every meeting we have, every conference call we do should always be going back to those same few points and the same few, this is how this supports our end goal. Frivolous things kind of distract and get us sidetracked, but keeping things focused by emphasizing the same few points that we know are important to repeat can help us keep focused and have a stronger impact when we go out to reach the public. When it comes to making the message compelling, um, it's really about identifying a concrete problem. People can't afford health care. Identifying a concrete solution, single payer. Identifying a concrete action that a person can do to advance the solution. I mean, that one's trickier, right? Because it is difficult to implement single payer through something like a citizen's initiative. But if you tell people, well, if you circulate a petition to get 50 signatures and so-and-so does, before you know it, we'll have enough and that'll go to a vote. If you can spell out for people how they contribute directly to the solution, that starts to change their mind. I know a lot of people that if you tell them this is a problem, they go, yep. And then you tell them, well, this is a solution. They say, yep. And then you say, well, this is how you can get involved. They say, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just don't see, it. I don't see us winning. I see us losing. Well, one of the, the phrases that we used to try to sell a case on expanding Medicare was preparing a workforce or, or having a prepared workforce, right. preparing a workforce, you know, because that played into the assumption that these people who just were sitting at home. And I, I remember that as being one of the examples of what you're talking about. It was right. preparing a healthy workforce or something. I forget. Right. What and, and, you know, so there's elements to that uh, that are definitely more strict father, emphasizing the importance of building a strong workforce 
not necessarily focusing on you know the quality of, of life for those workers which would be more nurturing parent but um, you know people need to know that when it comes to the actions that we take as an organization they need to know that there's a way for them to be a part of that and that it's actually changing things it's building toward a solution and personal anecdotes if any of you have them and many of you probably do whether it's you or a loved one or somebody you know or care about those have the biggest impact in making a message compelling because it underscores why this matters it's not abstract it's real and uh, some next steps for for span is I think we need to develop our major talking points for each framework and practice delivering them succinctly and effectively uh, you know really starting to get people into the habit of being able to go into a town put up some flyers saying hey hear about single payer this might be a one horse town but go talk to the horse in that case um, really get people out there and learn to talk to them in their communities about why this matters that's really what you need for recruitment but before you go into a community you need to know how to talk to people you need to be comfortable talking uh, uh, to people who might think differently and have a different framework of the world than you do um, I think sometimes we have a problem with just kind of doing things randomly and periodically we're not always consistent with the timing of them we kind of do it a little bit here and there and then we're quiet for a year or two um, when you have consistent actions people start to remember you as the organization to go to and that really matters for a lot of people that gets people motivated because they know that you're always there and you're reliable that gives people confidence to say maybe this group can get the change and it's not hopeless you know but being consistent and always showing up is really critical there um, everything we do should really make a compelling argument about why we're doing what we're doing we have to have the appearance which I think is true that we really care about this issue that it really matters and that there is a way to win uh, when people see that in the way meetings are conducted and the way that we communicate with folks that really has it goes a long way um, this is a little bit into the mechanics of campaigning but there's a big difference between persuasion work and base building work I think this is a big uh, point of confusion for folks uh, when you're talking to a supportive crowd you want to talk to them about very different things than if you're going out to somebody who's not even sold that single payer is a good thing some people need persuasion and that's a whole different conversation than people who already know that it's a good solution but they want to know how do we get there the, fir the former is persuasion the latter is base building people who already agree with you how do you get them energized mobilized activated that's a different conversation and a different presentation than okay what is single payer and why should you subscribe to it I've unfortunately seen people call events for different <laughs> issues and you know they get a bunch of people together who care about an issue whether it's an environmental one or a labor one and all they talk about is well why why this matters and I sometimes talk to people who attend those afterwards and they say well I kind of already knew that I was really hoping they were going to tell me what we can do about it and we never quite got there or they're really vague on the particulars I'm a little disappointed um, you need to we need to get good at practicing base building you know how do we engage those people in a way that they're gonna you know show up and say I'm already sold what do we do what do we do you know you gotta capitalize on that energy so uh, I think the other thing to do is always to respond topically because when we talk about you know doing grassroots campaigns a lot of it comes down to the timing uh, right now it's been a very good time to talk about single payer because the attacks on the Affordable Care Act have forced the issue of health care in America to the forefront okay it's all over the news it's a real it's a real policy decision that's gonna have real consequences so everyone's talking about it now is the time to talk about single payer as an alternative and to everyone who's been doing that work thank you that has been so important and it is different from you know say a year ago or even two years ago when yeah I mean it's always relevant right single payer is always a relevant subject but sometimes it's a little more relevant than others based on what Congress is thinking about doing and what we can do to try to influence that so you have to pay attention and respond to those events sometimes that's an act of Congress sometimes that's a court decision sometimes it's a really bad story about something that happened in your town or your city or your state that you know people need to hear about to see why we need change you know but it's about capitalizing on those moments in time when people are really thinking about a matter and you can step in and offer a solution say look we've been talking about this for years and it's about time we got serious with it that resonates with people more than you know doing it in odd years and then just kind of phoning it in when the issue's hot so that's the end of my 
presentation. I wanted to take a few more questions or comments as long as I think we have a little bit of time. Steph? Hi. Um, I was thinking back previously this week. I was hanging out with a friend. We are watching a movie called Heist. Has Robert De Niro in it. Okay. Go on. <laughs> the father in that film has to get three hundred thousand dollars for his kid's surgeries, otherwise she will no longer be worked on and she'll die. It was a very weird premise, but I basically made a joke. Why not just move to Canada? And he proceeds to pause the movie and go into this weird ramble about how Denmark and Canada are going bankrupt because of their NHS or equivalent. Right. And the same two stories about how the health care is bad. Just the same two, as if that is a very common thing for the millions of people covered by these, you know, single payer NHS. And I, I finally like realized with this like um, presentation why it bothered me so much. It was just problem, 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 but repeat. People get stuck in this cycle and only focus on like what they want to pull to make something look bad, but now they don't really go forward and go, well, what's the solution? Do you pay out a ton of money, go bankrupt, and risk dying, or do you wait a bit just so you can gamble, you know, the will you be covered, will, you, will your life be safe? And it's more likely your life will be safe, but I didn't know exactly how to proceed with um, a conversation like that. I can't just go, so what is the solution, do you think? Right. That, that seems very cool. Well, I, I think the, re the real answer to that is you can't. And that's something, too, that we need to get used to is some people, honestly, we get stuck in this where we find the most, the person who's like, I read this fr report from this think tank and I'm adamantly opposed and I have all these reasons, I just say, okay. <laughs> because, honestly, the amount of time it would take for me to talk to them and build a relationship and convince them, that's time I could have gotten 10 people who already agree that this matters out in the streets talking about why it matters to them. Yeah. So it's a matter of, you know, with petitioning, I, I guess you're right too. I mean, I've always, I've always had that one person right. out of twenty that's just like, "Blah, I'm okay. Have a good day, sir." Yeah. But like, there's always that other nineteen right. that will. And you have to resist the temptation to engage the people yeah. who are adamantly yeah. against yeah. you. <laughs> Because we, logically, we always want to do that. We want to prove somebody wrong. But the reality is, you just need to accept that there are some people, but we know from polling, those people are really in the minority. And there is, going back to every campaign is an exercise in managing scarce resources. One of those most important resources is your time. Speaking of which, we might need, so you don't want to spend too much of that time. Okay. We take one more question, but it should be brief. Okay, one more brief question. Who's got one? Right there. How do we measure? a message to know that we're hitting our mark? That's a difficult one because there's no, I don't think there's a silver bullet for that. I think trial and error, uh, honestly, sometimes ends up being some of the best you can do. Okay. There are plenty of opportunities to talk to people locally and to hold town halls to engage your friends, family, we, people on social we media. We do focus groups. I mean, I, right. qualitative research is not hard in, in, in terms of, you know, I think we should volunteer to set up focus groups and test the messages. No, we, we used to I think that would be excellent. And I know that there's already some work done on that, and maybe it's a matter of looking at what other focus groups have already accomplished. But doing some locally in Ohio, I think, would go a long way in helping us to understand the impact yeah. of certain yeah. words. Yeah. And understanding Lakoff's concept of framing, I think, will help us to understand why certain places might have certain responses in a certain way and that would go a long way so with that uh, thank you so much I appreciate uh, your, your attention and enjoy